things are going to be a little bit historical for us today. Um, we're going to talk about the first ladies. We're going to talk about the lunch ladies. And then we're going to get into the little punks that always picked on the lunch ladies. All with the same guy, Andrew Oak. In a brief, glorious moment, I was almost president. Sort of, not really. Now let me just play a sweet song that I'll never hear. Hey, up to me, I'm the presidential gonzo. Hunt with the ball, cause it's silent like the night. Eat moose is raw, so the souls go into my soul. I'll move the White House to Kalamazoo. Andy, how you doing? I'm good, Maddox, Devin, man. How are y'all today? Oh, we're good. Man, we're in the South. It's hot, but aside from that, we're okay. <laughs> Dude, I'll tell you what, man. Up here in Maryland, uh, outside of your nation's capital, it is not cool. we got a heat advisory. They've been telling everybody to stay indoors. You walk outside to get the mail, and you come back, and you need a shower, man. It Damn, is in Maryland? It's cool up here. Yes, sir. And I'm, uh, I'm by the Chesapeake Bay, so i got a nice little bay breeze coming across my land, and it's still that warm. Ugh. Ooh, I, I, I was going to offer to swap with you, but I don't think I will. <laughs> No, man. All we'd be doing is changing different kinds of food that we eat, man. We're, I know we're going to get into some food, and we got a lot of mutual friends in the food game, but, you know, all the travels I do and all the time I spend down in, in Memphis with, with traffic reporter uh, Heather York and, and running through old Chef Steph Cook's Rock and Grub, man. All right, now, hold on. We, we don't want to get into Princess Golden Bun here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you, man, nothing. Nothing's off limits, man. I'm ready to go. What do you want to start with? You want to start with the first ladies? Yeah, let's start with the first ladies. What's your fascination with the first ladies in particular? Yeah, well, here's the thing, man. I'm, I, but after I toured in my band, and uh, 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 my dad said, "Well, you know, it might be time to use your your college degree." And I did. I was a I was a radio, television, and film major from University of Maryland, and I've always been interested in television production, and I've done some documentaries in ESPN 30 for 30s and traveled with presidents and done political news out of the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., for years. And I stumbled upon this First Ladies project with C-SPAN and the White House Historical Association. And I took the job because I thought it was fascinating. I thought it was interesting. I thought I'd be able to tell stories that hadn't been told about these uh, uh, unique women, these, this unique sorority of women, but I didn't think I was going to fall in love with all of them like I did. And, and the influence and impact and partnership they've had in leadership from the very, very beginning and growing up outside of Washington, D.C. and not knowing as much as I should have both embarrassed me and fascinated me. And I pop out the backside of this, this project, which was the C-SPAN series, uh, First Lady's Influence and Image, uh, I pop out this first lady's expert, and I, I wrote a speech and started speaking at presidential libraries, museums, Colonial Williamsburg, the Smithsonian, schools. I've spoken to a couple schools down in Memphis, uh, state universities. I've uh, been across the country giving this speech and talking about women's leadership and how important they've been in our formula of leadership and, and the effects they've had on the modern world. And then I wrote two books, and then here I am talking to you guys, man. It's been a fantastic journey, and uh, uh, one that continues every day. And we are the low point of his career. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. I mean, you're close. I don't know if you're the lowest. You're down there. I'll take it. <laughs> no, man, I love it, man. I love, I, lo I love all of it. The fact that you guys are even interested, in, and and you know the things that bring us all together in social media and common interests, and the fact that we can do this sort of. We can hit all the gamut. You know, your introduction, it, it cracked me up. You know, it's like we're going we're to talk about first ladies. We're going to talk about food and the lunch ladies. Then we're going to talk about the punk rocks that skip lunch to hang out back and in the smoker's corner and their leather jackets in the summertime. I mean, I love it. I love all of it. I love, I love life. I love the celebration of life, the stories of all these people. And it's interesting when you go through each of the different first ladies, you can find something that you have in common with all of them because guess what? They're real people. They're women, they're young girls, they're girlfriends, they're wives, they're aunts, they're sisters, they're cousins, they're grandmothers. They're real people that live, laugh, love, win, lose. And when you take the politics out of them and you look at what they do as unpaid and unelected women, 
probably the most powerful unpaid and unelected women in the world and how the things they did affect and shape our modern world, you really have to take a step back and admire these, these wonderful women. I agree, and I think the best way to handle this is let's say, uh, tell us about, pick five of your favorite first ladies. Okay. And tell us what, tell us some things that we may not know. Well, here's, okay, let's start off with number one, because that's always a good place to start, and I think it sets the tone. Martha Washington. George Washington was not Martha Washington's first husband. And a lot of people do not know that or don't have that on the forefront of their brain when they think about it. Yeah, per perfect example. And, and, and her first husband is why she is the woman she is that George Washington meets. If George Washington had not met the 26-year-old widow in Williamsburg, Virginia, the United States would not happen and the modern world would look very differently. And I don't say that lightly and I don't say that in jest or even cheeky. It, it's, it's fact. Martha Dandridge married a man named Daniel Park Custis. Daniel Park Custis was super wealthy, super privileged. The wedding almost didn't happen because Martha Dandridge wasn't of the same social standing. But they talked Custis's father into it. She was a highly educated woman without a formal education, but she was also intelligent. And there's a difference. You can be educated and not intelligent, or you can be ed intelligent and not educated. But when Custis dies and leaves Martha Custis a widow at the age of 26, she turns into the first successful female CEO of the colonies. She's in charge of 8,000 productive tobacco acres. She's pulling in money hand over fist. She owns about a quarter of Williamsburg in real estate. And at the time of her husband's death, she had probably four or five times the Virginia State Governor's annual salary in cash on hand. And if you look back at paintings of her when she's 26, she's hot. Everyone isn't born an old lady with gray hair in an apron. You know, I mean, she's a 26-year-old woman. She's uber wealthy. She's running this this massive estate and 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 has finances out the wazoo and her good-looking strapping young general george washington and you know if he came home and said hey honey i got an idea i'm gonna overthrow the king and start a new country i mean she could have told him to take a leap she could have split just then but he couldn't have done it without her finances her help her capability and being able to take care of all this while he went and ran the war the other amazing thing about her her is that during the Revolutionary War, General Washington writes letters to friends that says he can't think straight without Martha at his side. He needs her with him at nearly every winter encampment that she travels to at great personal risk to confide and consult and advise and entertain foreign dignitaries and financiers of the Revolution, the French and other generals, and put on massive events in the middle of these uh, frozen tundras of fields of the Revolutionary War. She's a highly, highly capable woman, and it's not a stretch to say if there was not Martha Washington, there would not be America, and the world would look a lot different. Think about World War II, World War I, uh, McDonald's, Apple, Harley Davidson. I mean, all this stuff, Coca-Cola, everything that America is, is to, falls on the shoulders of a 26-year-old wi widow. So she served more as more than a wife and the typical first lady. She was to a degree, his consigliere. 100%. 100%. And she's not alone. When you look at these women, I wanted to find out, when I've signed on to the project, what we care about these women and why we had the series and everything is their time in the White House and their time as First Lady. And that's significant, obviously. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about them if they were not. But they are First Lady. But outside of that, who are the women that would marry these men who would become president? Because think about this. Even though she inherited all that wealth and fortune and land from her first husband, she didn't own any of it legally. She was just a steward. She was a keeper of it for her sons because women couldn't own land. Women couldn't vote. I mean, after the Civil War, when African-American men first got the chance to vote, Congress almost didn't give them the right to vote because they were worried, oh, what's next? Women? Women are going to vote? And you think about 
the hierarchy of society. Look, slavery is a horrible thing, and I don't want to get into a big, you know, right or wrong. It's obviously very, very wrong, and the problems that have still, you know, stem from it. But if you think about in in the in the in in the level of society and where slaves were, they were property. People owned them. They were beaten. They were treated horribly. But white Congress in the 1860s is more willing to give their former property the right to vote before their own wives. I mean, that's that's a that's a really Weird thing to think about the perspective of where women fit into the puzzle pieces, even though they were helping out and advising and being the campaign managers and the partners in leadership and the advisors to their husbands the whole way. Another woman I'll tell you about, Abigail Adams. Abigail Adams writes a very, very famous letter to her husband when her husband was deciding to run for uh, president, when he was going to run for the second president of the United States after he served his, his two terms as vice president under George Washington. And she said, remember the ladies. A lot of people know that quote and remember that quote and associate it with Abigail Adams, but I've held the letter at the Massachusetts Historical Society. I held the letter that says, remember the ladies. And she says, remember the ladies. When you have them in the, your favor, the men will be on your side. Now think about that. In the 1890s, she's writing a letter that says, if you have the ladies on your side, the men will be in your favor. What that means is, if I come home and I say, you know, I got Heather sitting at home, Colonial Heather uh, sitting at home, and I walk in and I say, hey, honey, the uh, election's tomorrow. She goes, oh, really? Who are you going to vote for? I said, well, I'm going to vote for John Adams. And she said, well, that's, that's a dumb idea. I'd say, oh, wow, I'd start to second-guess myself. But i come home and i say, hey, honey, I'm voting for John Adams. She says, well, that's a smart idea. He's a great candidate. I've been watching. I've been paying attention. I've been reading in the paper what he says. Then I go down to the tavern and grab my pint of grog, and I say, hey, guess what, lads? I'm voting for John Adams, and I'm a smart man because my wife says so. What she's basically saying is, and I know this is probably true in your homes. It's true in my home. When we're sitting in front of our TVs, who's holding the remote? Me. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Men are holding the remote. I hold the remote. It's my big, smart TV. Exactly. I, I'm the man. I got all the power. But who's picking the shows? Good point. <laughs> I'm not picking the shows. Princess Golden Bun wants to watch Dateline. Princess Golden Bun wants to watch Pitbulls and Parolees. Abigail Adams. Oh, I could have a talk with her TV. about her choices of TV. <laughs> oh, she'd throw some out about me, man, some of the shows I watch. But listen, man, I'm telling you. Hundreds of years before women would have the chance to vote, hundreds of years before electricity, Abigail Adams knew that men were holding the remote, but women were picking the shows. She said, remember the ladies, for when you have them in your favor, the men will be on your side. And she knew it. And, and it's been that way from the beginning. In, in today's terminology, basically what she was saying is, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's it. Happy <laughs> wife, happy life. Exactly. Uh, now, seeing as you brought up um, the issue of the Civil War. Let's skip ahead. Uh, give us some detail into Mary Todd Lincoln. Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, here's something that's going to blow your mind. She never went by Mary Todd Lincoln. That's a modern incarnation of this woman. And she always signed her name, Mary Lincoln, Mrs. Abraham Lincoln, Mrs. <laughs> President Lincoln. And we now call her Mary Todd Lincoln. But so many things we're still finding out about this woman and still finding, you know, it's hard. This whole series and all my travels in the books, someone like Mary Lincoln is like Jacqueline Kennedy or, 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 you know, it's someone that we think we know everything about. And my challenge was, what can I find out that's different? What can I find out that's new? And here's what I found out. You know, everyone talks about and writes about when she was Mary Todd and growing up. She was very, very sad, very depressed because she lost her mom and she had an evil stepmother. Well, guess what? You know, they th people take that from diary writings of, of, uh, of a, a, a teenage girl that didn't like her stepmom. That's every damn Disney story that's out there. Walt Disney made a freaking fortune off of that story. And we take that in the wrong way. We take it so literally as we're reading this and romanticizing this history and changing it to fit what we think it should be. But I was found that in Lexington, Kentucky, where Mary Todd was born, she had a amazing childhood. She had educational privilege beyond belief. She was taught things that women of her day were not taught. She rode a pony to school. 
she had a house full of stepbrothers and sisters. She had two grandmothers that were wildly successful and wealthy widows and had massive amounts of land, wealth, and privilege. And you know what? She didn't get along with her stepmother every once in a while. She probably didn't get along with, too well with her mother at times and would have fought with her. I know I fought with my mom. Y'all probably fought with your moms, too. It's just what we are. But we have to, we have to bring all of this stuff written in the past and in the romanticized versions and modernize it and put some perspective in it. But here's the thing that I found out when I was in Illinois about Mary Lincoln. And she was institutionalized uh, as an adult after her husband died. And you think about it. I mean, we don't have, they didn't have back then the support groups that we have now. They didn't have the, the, the antidepressant medications and the counseling and all the other stuff that we have in this modern time psychoanalysis and stuff. So a lot of people were self-medicating. Well, you know, Mary wasn't the most stable person. I get it. A lot of people died in her life. A lot of people died in everyone's lives before you know, antibiotics and, and, and blood transfusions and, and, and all the other modern sciences and, and medical advances we enjoy today. But on top of that, every year around the time of her husband's death, she would self-medicate with all kinds of stuff. I mean, you could buy cocaine over the, the counter, you know? I mean, it was just a, a different time. Oh, the good and, old days. <laughs> yeah, sure, right? Back when you could have a good time. But... um so she was getting in kind of a, 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 a an adult state, and her her she because women couldn't vote, women couldn't own land, women didn't have rights, certainly not not equal rights to any extent, and so she wasn't allowed to speak at her own insanity trial. And we look at that with modern eyes, and we think, well, this is horrible, this is vicious, this is just uh, inhumane treatment. It just was it was the way of the world back then. But they all then in modern times we sort of uh, uh, demonize. Robert Lincoln, her son that had her institutionalized. Well, I found new letters that had been written back in the day from a guy in Chicago that was saying that Mary Lincoln hallucinated fire in her own apartment. And even back then they knew that if you're living on the eighth floor of some place and you hallucinate fire, you might jump out the window. And she was found wandering the streets in her undergarments. And she was buying clothes, uh, I mean, uh, furniture for a apartment that was already furnished and not coming to pick him up and just doing weird stuff. So they got her in this institution in Bellevue outside of Chicago. They got her sobered up a little bit, and it turned out that she was pretty much all right. And she went back to Illinois and with her sister and, and had a fairly enjoyable retirement, you know, given the givens of, of all the loss in her life. But it's really, really interesting when you dive a little bit deeper into these women's lives, especially the ones that we think we know everything about, and find out sort of what the source was and, and balance it out as the times have changed with social norms and laws and, and, and uh, uh, attitudes towards uh, uh, gender equality and civil rights. Is there anything written on how she coped with the pressure that her husband faced while in the aftermath of freeing the slaves uh, it, it was, there is and and it was hard on everyone and, and a modern a modern version of it would be sort of how uh, Pat Nixon handled Watergate when when Nixon was being uh, 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 well when Nixon retired I'm making air quotes you know but I mean all of these guys these presidents they go through a lot of public scrutiny. Think about someone like Barbara Bush, when not only her husband, but then her son, and then another son whose governor goes through this. And people say, and they were saying this back in the days of the Civil War, people were saying awful things. Mary Lincoln was part of what we believe to be an assassination attempt on the president before he was assassinated. Someone tampered with, uh, with one of the, the, the coaches, one of the, the um, uh, uh, um, Stagecoach. The stage carriage. Coach. Carriage, carriage, thank you. There was a carriage accident, and Mary was thrown from the carriage when she was on her way out to uh, the summer cottage that's just outside of Washington, D.C., and she got thrown out of the carriage and, uh, and, and bumped her head, which could have, you know, an untreated concussion could have. I mean, at that point, they thought, like, fresh air was the cure for everything, and they'd send you out in the mountains to breathe fresh air. I mean, it was, it was primitive medicine, for sure. So that could have added to some of the some of the the issues that she had later in life. But she would she would uh, she got taken advantage of. She was in a weakened state of mind. Her husband was being written about in the papers. Her husband was having assassination attempts on him. Conspiracy theorists were were all all running amok, and and it was a very 
unsettled time, and he was doing something that was very, very unpopular, and something that we still deal with today. I mean, you look at the, the Civil War statues, the Confederate statues that have been pulled down, how long we've, we've been working on reconstruction and civil rights and all the stuff through the years. I mean, Mary Lincoln would have been in the thick of that. And she is the extension of her husband, the president, and her, pre her husband was the number one target of the Confederacy and the, and the, uh, the, the opposition at the time. So all of that would have trickled down to her, including the death of her children, then the death of her husband, and all that stuff. It was a very, very tough thing to handle. Women have a tough time. Uh, any, not even just women. The families of the presidents have a tough time handling these, these things now in modern times. And back then, it would have been just as much or just as bad. Aside from Mary Lincoln, I... I was always a, a Reagan fan. It's the first presidency I can really remember in my life. Sure, me too. We're, we got to be about the same age. Uh, yeah, I'm about to hit forty. <laughs> Unfortunate. <laughs> well, I got, I got, I got a little bit more on you because actually, the first presidency I remember is the is the Ford presidency. So I go back a little bit further. I was, I was actually at Reagan's first inauguration. Oh I was damn! Great. But my mom took me out of school and brought me down. I actually write about it very affectionately. Um, not to jump ahead of you, but I know you're, you're headed towards Reagan. But, um, sadly, my, my mom passed away in 2010, and she, she never saw any of this project and any of this work. And out of all the stuff that I've done, she would have probably enjoyed this the most. So I dedicate both of my books and this work to her memory because this is just right up her alley. I mean, she loves politics. She loved living outside the nation's capital. She always worked at the polls. And uh, she was a big Reagan fan, and, and when, when he got elected, she took me out of school because she thought it would be important for me to see the political process and the peaceful transfer of power and took me down in that bitter cold to the parade, standing along the parade route to watch the Reagans go by on their way to the White House that first year. And it was it was an incredible memory, and, and my mom was just really cool like that. So anyway, wow. your, your, your question is? I, I was just going to say, I mean, everybody knows Nancy for... The just say no campaign. Yep. But there had to be more to that woman's political, because given Ronnie's altered mental state in his second term, did she almost act as in in a similar fashion to Eleanor Roosevelt? Well, that's a, you know what that that's a, that's an excellent point. Here, here's one thing that I, that I that I always mention in 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 my public speeches and, and events. I go back to that point that I made that George Washington wrote letters. We have the letters. We read the letters. We know he said during the Revolutionary War he couldn't think straight without his wife at his side. I'm old enough to remember. You're old enough to remember that Ronald Reagan said, "I don't make any decisions without running them by Nancy." When he said that, he got blasted in the press. But my point is, these presidents have been doing it since the beginning of our country, since the, before the beginning of our country, when we were still colonies, George Washington was doing it. It's part of our fabric of structure, of leadership, and what birthed this great country of ours. It's this partnership, this team of man and woman, and what they do. And you go through my books and you can read how each of these women were influential to each of their husband's administration. But Nancy Reagan was highly influential. He bounced off. And I don't even think, I'll be honest with you, I don't think it was because of his mental capacity. Eleanor Roosevelt that you alluded to, she did a lot for FDR because FDR physically with the polio couldn't go to some of these places that she went. Right. And she would bring back, she was his recon woman. She was, she was, she was literally his legs. He'd say, you know, Eleanor, darling, get out there and find out what the situation is. And she'd go running off to wherever, and she'd come back and give him. But this was also part of a, a very, very shrewd political strategy. Because if she came back, whatever decision the president made, if it was the wrong decision or something went bad or didn't go as well as they had planned, he could say, well, you know, I didn't see it with my own eyes. I had to go off my wife's uh, 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 information. And so she was almost the fall guy if things were to go bad. She and was a built-in scapegoat. 100%. 100%. But also, the Eleanor Roosevelt story is so fantastic. She She's the longest-sitting first lady. She, 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 her husband was elected to an unprecedented and, in all likelihood, unrepeated 
four terms. So she was there longer than anyone else, so that gives her the opportunity to do more than anyone else, on top of the fact that her husband was physically handicapped, so she needed to go out. But here's the thing. FDR would not have been president if it were not for Eleanor Roosevelt. When Eleanor Roosevelt found out that her husband was having an affair before the presidency, he had a girlfriend, he told her she wanted to get a divorce. Right about the same time, he got polio. FDR was a mama's boy. The longest sitting and wartime president and hero that FDR is was a mama's boy. He didn't do anything unless it was okay with his mother, Sarah Delano. And Sarah Delano said to Eleanor, you're not getting a divorce because Roosevelt's don't get divorced. How would it look in the public? There's too much finances at stake. You've got your children to think of, X, Y, and Z. And FDR said, well, okay, we're not getting a divorce. So Eleanor said, fine, we're not getting a divorce. But I'm also not sleeping in the same bed with you anymore. And at that time, with the polio and everything else, Sarah Roosevelt said, well, now it's time for you to just be a, 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 a um, just to, to, to be the head of the manor, to be a, a, a gentleman that stays at home and hosts society parties and does philanthropic work here and there and that other. So if FDR doesn't, if FDR ends his public life, so ends all any and all freedom or hope for Eleanor. So she hires a guy from down here around Washington to resurrect his public service career, get out there, run for president, and in so doing, then emancipated herself and gave herself the chance to get out there and do this public speaking. But if FDR had done what his mother wanted him to do and what his mother said that he should do and not followed this new career... Or, or continued this career in public service, he never would have run for president, and we wouldn't have had the longest sitting president and most influential first lady of all time, Eleanor Roosevelt. So that's how influential these women are and what they've done over time. Now, as far as Nancy Reagan goes, she was a right-hand man, woman, for President Reagan, just as most of these women are. Uh, Rosalind Carter, a lot of people don't know this, Rosalind Carter sat in on nearly every cabinet uh, and advisory meeting that happened in the White House because Jimmy Carter wanted her to hear. He wanted to go. When when you go home, you say to your wife, your girlfriend, whatever, you walk in and say, hey, how was your day today? Go, oh, and I, I interviewed this guy that, that wouldn't shut up and didn't give us half a breath to ask another question, Andy Oak. He was funny. He was cool, but, you know, whatever. I never said cool. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> I get off the phone with you guys, and I talk to Heather. She said, how was that interview? I'm like, oh, well, they were, those, those two knuckleheads are funny, and they knew a lot more than I thought they did about first ladies. So we have a good chuckle about it. But the president comes home. President Obama comes in and walks in, and Michelle says, hey, how was work today, honey? He goes, well, Putin's a real jackass and a pain in my neck. I mean, this is these women share a bed with the most powerful men in the world. When they talk about their day, they talk about world issues. And maybe they don't tell them everything, and there's some classified information, I guess, that doesn't get out, but they're still humans, like I said at the beginning. So Reagan was telling Nancy everything that he wanted feedback from, just like uh, William McKinley used to leave his office door open and his wife sitting outside whenever he had a meeting as governor or president. So after the meeting, they would walk out and they'd look down and say, oh, Mrs. McKinley, so wonderful to see you this afternoon. Have a lovely afternoon and not think anything of it. And as soon as the person that he had the meeting with left, William McKinley would say, Ida, step into my office now. Tell me, what did you hear and what do you think? And this has happened all throughout history with all these women. Well, so wait, 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 wait. There is another option. Sure. Are they sitting them out there so they don't have to recap their day every night? <laughs> <laughs> well, then what the hell are you going to talk about around the dinner table? Whatever's on TV. Jeez. Who still eats at a table? <laughs> That's a fair point. Maybe they're talking about pit bulls and parolees by the time they get to the dinner table. Or who won Survivor. Oh, God. But who you cares? You get my point. <laughs> you get my point. These women these women are, are I mean, best Truman was seen on discussions and decisions whether to drop the bomb or not. We know this. We know this to be true. And they didn't know it at the time. And you want to talk about a woman who was physically... And, 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 and mentally and operationally, the president of the United States, our first female president, was Edith Wilson. President Wilson had a stroke, an incapacitating stroke. It took him out of the picture for six months. 
Nothing went through that bedroom door or got to the president's eyes without going through Edith Wilson. She was the eyes, ears, and mouth, and sometimes hand in signature of appointments. I've seen the papers. I've read them in Stanton, Virginia at the Wilson Museum. See, what I did for this project for C-SPAN was I took seven bags of gear, a camera, two microphones, some lights, some cords, and I traveled all across the country. Every home, library, church, school, cemetery, plantation, farm, train station, every first lady, Martha Washington, then Michelle Obama. And now I extend out through the current first lady, Melania Trump. And I studied and I went into private collections, vaults, libraries, museums to find everything I could about each of these women. And each of them got it was just, it was more and more remarkable as I went along. So when I get to Stanton, Virginia, and find out that we've already basically had a female president in Edith Wilson, none of the country knew. They told, they told Congress and told the country and the world that President Wilson after the war was just tired and he needed to rest. And everyone said, I can imagine. Take it, take a little while, dude. Take it easy. They staged interviews and they released stuff to the press. I mean, it was almost like weekend at Bernie's. That's a, it's incredible. Wow, that, that's a good way of actually explaining it, honestly. Yeah, that, that's what it was. They, they propped him, I mean, I don't know if they propped him up at the window and tied a stick to his arm and made him wave out to the public, but I mean, it was pretty damn close. Damn. <laughs> now, you brought her up, so let's, let's, what have you, what can you tell us about Melania? I mean, she's our first, okay. What can you tell us about Melania that can be run on the air? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I knew it was coming because I, I mentioned that. I knew we'd get there eventually. I, she, she's a very, very interesting character. I mean, they, they all are. Um, she's interesting on multiple levels. First of all, she's the second only foreign-born first lady. Louisa Catherine Adams was the first foreign-born first lady. She was born in England in 1775. She'd never stepped foot in the country until she had married John Quincy Adams, who was working for the Monroe administration at the time as a dignitary. So she never met her in-laws until they were married, the former president, first lady. Uh, and she's an interesting case all on her own. I had just a remarkable, remarkable lady. This, the foreign travels that she had throughout Russia and Europe and Germany, all over the place as a, as the wife of a dignitary. But fast forward to, to Melania Trump. Um, when she was first the wife of a candidate, or even before Trump was the original candidate, it's when things were going in that direction, and I had a pretty good, pretty good, good idea that Trump, you know, leading in all the polls and all that stuff, it had surprised everyone and was going to be the candidate. I said Melania Trump is going to be a huge asset to him. I mean, she's young, she's attractive, highly fashionable. She's had philanthropic and business experience in her past. She's got a young kid. People always like when you got a young kid. She speaks five different languages. She's got a, a, a you know a foreign appeal to her on the world stage that could could do what a lot of first ladies do for their husbands. Also, someone as polarizing as Donald Trump. You know, you go back in time and some of the some of the less personable presidents like uh, Calvin Coolidge or James Madison, their wives were very outgoing. And, and very personalizing and humanizing first ladies. And, you know, Melania Trump can or does to a certain extent do that to her husband. There's a lot of speculation about what's going on now because whenever he seems to do something, she kind of gently does the opposite, you know, as far as like the, the, you know, coming out against the sports guys and, and the basketball players that she wants to go to the school and, you know, the immigration, she goes down and visits and stuff. So she's sort of, She's playing it safe in that she is humanizing these seemingly inhumane aspects of the Trump administration. But by doing that, she's going against her husband. I mean, she's standing up against this guy that, that, that people are disagreeing with on levels for certain issues. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting to watch. Um, well, in a way, she's proving that a woman doesn't have to have the same political opinions and leanings as their husband. One hundred percent, and 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 her 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 people have said it. She has said it. Uh, a lot of people. Whenever I post anything, I do daily posts on Facebook, and social media, Instagram, or you know, historical facts or whenever the first lady does something. You know, I, I put a I put a, a post about it, a link the article, and people. Are, a lot of times, you'll say, "Well, Donald Trump's the biggest bully out there. How can Melania Trump be against bullying 
when she's married to the biggest bully. And I, and I, I say, you know, if you believe Donald Trump is a bully, and I stay out of politics, that's not my game, and presidents aren't my game. Or at least, you know, as I'll talk about presidents as they relate to their wives, or as their wives relate to them, but not their policies, not their their, their politics, and anything like that, because that's a, a losing man's game, and it's too uh, it's just too vicious. And I leave that to other people and other platforms and other networks and other shows. But if your husband is criticized as being a bully, especially on social media, and then you go out and your main cause is anti-bullying and cyberbullying. Isn't that a smack in your husband's face to a certain extent? And she is standing up for herself and her own things. And she doesn't do things just because she's supposed to. So I think that that means when she does the things for the children or for opioids and drugs and things like that, she does it because she wants to, and that makes her more genuine. Keep in mind, guys, there's no job description here. Laura Bush said it best. Every first lady can make that role what they want, and they don't have to do anything. There's no job description. There's no pay. They're not elected. The only expectation is that you support your husband in most cases, but you could go back through all the affairs of all the presidents of all the time, and there's almost too many to list. There's more that you would even believe in. With Warren Harding, man, the stories I heard and stuff, there's legendary stuff that put, you know, the, this Trump stuff and even the Clinton stuff. I mean, look, that's another thing. What's good for one is not always good for another. What's bad for one isn't always bad for another. But the same stuff that's being said about Donald Trump and, and, and the left can't believe that Melania won't leave her and leave him and he should be impeached. That's the same stuff that the right was saying about Clinton and the left was saying, no, 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 this isn't so bad. And Hillary's a good woman to stay with her man have it both ways, guys. Either she's a good woman to stay with her man, or she should have left him. And the same goes for Melania. But we can't remember back just two administrations to even think about it. Well, three administrations now. Well, we actually, in, in, in an episode of The Simpsons that we watched earlier, uh, the, the Dixie Chicks made an appearance. Yeah. And I made the remark, you know, they were celebrities that said something in a foreign country against George W. Bush, and radio essentially just left them. Yep. Yet, how many celebrities these days have spoken out about Trump and continue to find work? 100%. 100%. Here's, here's, here's also something I want you to consider. This, this, is, this is probably the main point I can bring up about Melania Trump. And she, it's what she has in common with Michelle Obama. These are the first two social media first ladies. In my studies and my research and my travels and my writings, I find that Laura Bush was the last first lady that everyone loved no matter what they thought about her husband. Now, historically, women have gotten crap for what their husbands have done and, and they've been lumped together. I'm, 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 I'm not trying to suggest that they aren't. But they always poll higher than their husbands. And people, when you leave an administration, people, people rarely have anything bad to say about a first lady. But that ended with Michelle Obama. And I think one of the contributing factors, a major contributing factor, is social media. She's the first full-blown social media first lady. Like you said, Nancy Reagan, just say no. Man, uh, 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 Charles Barkley and some other guy were lifting her up on the, on the floor of the NBA, slam dunking, just say no basketballs. She was on different strokes. She did stuff with Mr. T. She was all over the place. Pop culture. These first ladies have always been punching ad campaigns and philanthropic endeavors and have, had, for the most part, no problem putting their, putting their image out there. But social media changes everything, because now, not only does everyone have an opinion, but everyone thinks their opinion matters to everybody. They also do not get fact-checked. They also sit in the safety of their little bubble and their home and their laptop or their smartphone, which they have access to 24-7 to spew out their opinions, and their rancor and their vicious comments and their nonsense about both Michelle Obama and Melania Trump and have it go unchecked and 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 with, with no repercussions. No one comes back and says, well, you know what? What you said about that first lady, what you said about Michelle Obama was wrong. She's not a man. 
What she said about Michelle, Melania Trump was not true. Uh, she doesn't have a body double. But people continue to put this stuff out there. Anyone can put whatever they want on social media all day, every day, and people who read it take it as fact. It's all just opinion. Not all, but I mean, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So, I, I've got to ask one. Who do you think is the least influential first lady? Well, I mean, you can go back in time, and there were first ladies that, because of health, never served as first lady. Uh, Anna Harrison never stepped foot in Washington, D.C., because her husband came to D.C. to be inaugurated, and he died 32 days in office after catching pneumonia after giving the longest inaugural speech in history. So, clearly, she was not influential. Um, there's some women that are, that are very quietly influential, that don't go out as publicly and do it, like Pat Nixon. A lot of people don't know Pat Nixon was the most traveled first lady and second lady wife of a vice president until Hillary Clinton out-traveled her. That woman went everywhere and was an ambassador for our country and her husband's administration and did philanthropic work with the Marine Corps and the Red Cross after earthquakes down in Peru and went to leper colonies and stuff, all without the big fanfare. Um, you've got, you know, Nancy Reagan kind of quietly did it. By, uh, uh, Rosalind Carter did it very quietly, attending all those meetings. And then Hillary Clinton came through and, and did it very publicly. And, and, and was, you know, Hillary Clinton is, is one of the most accomplished first ladies in, in all of history. They're, she's the only first lady to become a U.S. senator. She's the only first lady to become a secretary of state and the only woman to become a presidential uh, a candidate for a major political party. No one can take away all those accomplishments. But all of the, all of the, 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 the friends that she gained in politics didn't outweigh the enemies when it came to the scandals and the problems that followed her along and, and made it so that, you know, it wasn't enough to get her elected. She broke every glass ceiling but the one that she wanted to, which was president. Right. Um, so, you know, as far as, as, far as the, the least influential first ladies go back in history to some of the older ones in the, in, in the, in the 19th century that, that never showed up as first lady because of, of health or other reasons. Gotcha. Um, okay, let's tell everybody how they can keep in touch and find out more about the First Ladies and you yourself, the First Ladies Man. I make it easy. Go to firstladiesman.com. You can find me there. That'll link you to all my social media. That's where you can buy my books. You can see all my, you guys get me a link to this podcast. That'll go on my video page. Other podcasts are there television interviews, radio interviews, articles I've written. There's a speaking tour page so you can see where my next uh, speaking event is. The store page gets you uh, volume one and volume two signed, an official First Ladies Man t-shirt. We've got it all there for you wrapped up in a nice little bow. And the video page at the top, you can also watch the full C-SPAN series online. Uh, I link to that as well. So firstladiesman.com is where you go to find out everything you need to know about me. I can tell you right now, I think we may have to have you back on for President's Day. Oh, yeah. I'll come back on. No problem. I think that could be a blast. Uh, for of sure. course, now you know what time it is. Lunch break! <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Just one style, I could never 
Well, here's the thing. In the book, at the end of each chapter, every first lady has a chapter in the book. Every first lady and hostess. Volume one is Martha Washington through Ida McKinley, the 1700s and 1800s. Volume two is Edith Roosevelt, the first first lady of the 20th century, all the way up to and including what we know about Melania Trump thus far, or my thoughts on Melania Trump thus far. At the end of every chapter, because I did all this travel, pinballing across the United States, I tell you where to eat when you're in town. It's like a history book and a travel log and a... And a, and a uh, uh, road guide, travel guide. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a fun, fun read. And at the end, I tell you about some of the really unique places I've stopped and eaten. And it's funny, I end up, you know, with a girlfriend in Memphis, Tennessee, and barbecue is one of my favorite things. And I've eaten barbecue from one coast to the other traveling through this series. How did you end up with Princess Golden Bun anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I told you there was nothing off limits, and then there you go. Yeah, well, Heather and I met. Heather and I met. Dude, she's a traffic reporter for iHeartRadio, and I was doing TV production in Washington D.C. before I did the First Ladies Project. And just throughout the years, we hit it off, and we stayed in touch. And when I was finishing my first book, um, and I and I write about this in the books. When I was finishing my first book, I wanted to celebrate, and uh, I decided to celebrate down in Memphis. Tennessee, and we went to Graceland. Uh, she got me VIP tickets on for the Graceland tour because she knew I was a big Elvis fan, and she was judging um, uh, Skinny's uh, cheese, uh, first grilled cheese fest, and the second grilled cheese fest is coming up, and that uh, benefits an animal rescue down there in Memphis, and animal uh, uh, rescue animals are very near and dear to my heart. They're very near and dear to Princess Golden Bun's heart, and so we came together. It was animals and grilled cheese that brought us together. We need to get you guys both on to kind of pump that event up. Yo, we can do that as well. Uh, when's it coming up? It's uh, going to be Sunday, November 4th at the High Tone in Midtown. Okay. Uh, when are you back in Memphis? Uh, I'm back in Memphis uh, at some point in September. Okay. Uh, give me a holler when you guys get back in Memphis. Let's meet up at Steph's place. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Um, now... You've talked about food. I've seen a lot of your food excursions, including yesterday, <laughs> which looked like some very good eats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a good time in Memphis this past weekend. We went to Coletta's for the first time. I'd never had barbecue pizza and barbecue spaghetti before, and it was fantastic. Have you gone to the Memphis Barbecue Company in Horn Lake that I told you about yet for the barbecue meatloaf? Not yet. It's if you get that, make sure you do a little bit of extra exercising that day. Oh yeah, they have well, an. I mean, they have an item on the dessert menu you have to try. They have a donut uh, bread pudding. Oh my! <laughs> well, we always we always stop by Gibson's and uh, and get an. I did tell you this last time I was at Gibson's, we went there about nine o'clock this past Friday night. Uh, they had every one of our favorites. We got blueberry. Bacon maple, red velvet, old fashions. They had coconut. I mean, everything, everything on the menu that we wanted. Oh, man, now I know in talking to Steph that uh, we're going to be there on the eighth, and trying to finagle your girlfriend, fiance, to make an appearance while we're there to get her on the interview with Steph. Um, and. I know he is going to debut a burger that weekend that is he's making in our honor. I know very little about it other than three things that are being used. The house smoked peanut butter. Oh my god. The bacon. The the candied bacon. Yeah. And the buns are going to be Gibson's donuts. Jeez Louise. <laughs> Starting to make a think about coming back to, coming back early, aren't you? <laughs> well, I tell you what he needs to do. He needs to, and I got Steph uh, turned on to uh, Neil's onion rings over at Neil's oh. Music Room. Those are the best damn onion rings in Memphis, maybe beyond. I mean, I got a guy here at the Brick House in Shadyside where I live, Shadyside, Maryland. Uh, his onion rings are, are as good. They're not better. They are, they are as good as Neil's. I mean, if you want onion rings, you go to... Brick House in Maryland or Neil's in Memphis. And, and Chef Steph will stop in Neil's on his way home just to grab a bucket of onion rings <laughs> to eat on the, on the way out to where he lives. Uh, you throw, a, you throw a, a, a Neil's onion ring on top of the Chef Steph 
uh, candy bacon burger with the Gibson thing on the top, and I tell you, that's Memphis AF, if you know what I'm saying. You are not even kidding. Uh, <laughs> how did you know, you know you're talking to the first and only guy that's eating a double Jim Candy to the rescue burger. Okay, let's just back up into our buddy Chef Steph here. How did you meet this man? Uh, he had a food truck with rock and roll food names, and Heather found him on Facebook and knew that he was a good guy through mutual friends and just had good food. And one Friday she said, if you're still there, I'm going to come by and get food. This was like a month ago, maybe two months. And so she went by. He said he was staying a little extra for her. She got the full treatment there at, at the Sitco. The Sitco is summer in, and, and where is it? Uh, North, uh, oh gosh. North Highland. North Highland. Okay. So that's Sitco. That's where Chef is taking over. And, and he's got his, he's got his food truck parked in there and that goes out at times. You know, depending on how many people he's got working for him, where, and he goes to festivals and does all this stuff. But the next weekend I was going to be in town. And so we said, we told Steph that I'd be in town. So then I went and met him the first time. And I said, well, I want to, I was going to get the Tom Patty burger because it was a double because I hadn't eaten all day. And it was Friday and I'd been on a plane and I didn't eat in the airports because I had close connections and I just wanted some food. And he said, and so Heather said, well, I thought you were going to get the, the, the gym candy. And I said, well, I would like it, but that's only a single. And he goes, I'll make you anything you want. You want it to be a double, I'll make it a double. He goes, no one's ever done that, and that's quite a burger. Are you sure you're going to be able to get that, handle that? And Heather laughed, and I laughed, and we, you know, I, I, there was nothing left but wax paper <laughs> by the end of that. We, uh, we had the, the loaded fries, which uh, was so damn good there. I went, uh, it's been probably three, so we basically both met him about the same time. I think I met him a few weeks after you did. Um, I went down about three, three weeks or so ago, maybe a little bit longer, and uh, just, I was in Tunica for uh, my anniversary that Saturday night. We did, uh, Gabriel Iglesias was at one of the casinos. We went over and saw the show. Gotcha. And I told my wife, I was like, look, if we're leaving Tunica, let's go over to Memphis and let's go over to Steph's place because I've been talking to him and I really want to try the food. And we went over there and I was like, I don't know what to get. But I ended up getting the, the Jim Candy. And the so fries, good. which are to die for. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, the wife got the those catfish probably, tacos. Those are the, best, those are the best loaded fries I've ever had. Oh, God. Whatever uh, the hell is on there. I mean, that's I've had loaded tater tots and loaded French fries. And your French fries are typically... You know, see, those, Steph takes all of like your usual... like Your bacon cheeseburger, but he puts a spin on it. Your loaded fries, he puts a spin on it. Your you know, peanut butter dessert, he puts a spin on it. Every, your, your, uh, you know, mac and cheese, but he puts it in a block and he deep fries it. I mean, yeah. you know, he's just, everything he does, he takes it up a step, up a notch, and he makes, like, pub grub this really gourmet experience. You sit down and talk with him, and he'll come out there and sit down and talk with yeah. you there in the sit down. And, and, and there DJ, are no DJ, small plates. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. And DJ, DJ Maya Adidas is, is, is cranking out the club jams. I mean, it's a, it's a scene over there, and you're sitting right by about, 15 different varieties of Vienna sausage and people are running in and out buying their 40s for brown bagging on a Friday, Saturday night, man. It's a show. It's a real show down there. You're chomping on your cool lickle and man, I mean, it's it's the real deal. It was um, so good that when I got ready to go, I actually ordered the Livin' La Vida Porca to go so I could have it as a snack later that night. <laughs> um, and he brought out a couple of the fried but peanut butter and banana cheesecake uh, it's the nutter butter. It's the nutter 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 butter cheesecake spring roll or something like yeah, that. Yeah, those and, things and are sauces. God, dude, I was dipping the French fries in every single sauce he pulled out. He's got homemade smoked gouda pimento cheese and the that French fries in that caramel. Oh dear lord! Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of it. All of it. <laughs> and I found out that he's going to start. He's thinking about starting to put the fry spice into shakers and selling it. I, look, man, I don't. Anything he does is good, and I he kept he just kept bringing out more stuff. I mean, because you know, he, I've got my first lady's man following. Heather's got her traffic following, and all her all her wackiness, and and you know, you put it out there, and people start coming in, and they say, "Hey, we heard Heather York talk about this. Hey, we heard the first lady's man talk about this. We want to come in." And then some of Heather's lifelong friends are going in there, 
and 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 then they're going and bringing their friends without Heather or without me, and then they're telling you know it's like the old Brett commercial, and then she told two friends, and she told two friends, and she told two friends, and so on and so on and so on, and that's how you do it, man. I it's just, all grassroots. You can't. I can't find a fault with the guy at all. He came in. We went in, ordered. Um, he was behind the, well, he was already in the kitchen starting up everything because we got there around four on a Sunday and, mm -hmm. uh, he had, I think Jep was working with him. Yep. And, Jep's awesome. And Jep went to the back and he came out and I walked over and introduced myself and all of a sudden he just starts bringing things that we didn't order to the table. <laughs> yeah. And I'm I know, like, he's going to have to chill out. He's going to go out of business. He keeps giving everyone the free samples, and everything. It's like Baskin Robbins, and everything's on a taste spoon, man. Man, he will. You'll gain twenty pounds in a sitting. It's good stuff. But isn't it? the quality of the food, I mean, and oh, especially sure. his price. I mean, nothing on the menu is over eleven bucks. Oh, I know. I know. I mean, that's just dangerous. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. We had and and uh, she's so high. Burger was. That's that's another okay. So so something was going down in the Memphis Flyer, and they were doing something about Memphis Burger Week or the best burger or something. And he made a special burger for that. And I don't even know what was in it, other than there was an incredible sauce, a fresh bun, pineapple, some great kind of cheese, and some infused herb something or other. Man, I don't even know. And the know. pineapple was uh, soaked in vodka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So we had when we went the first time. I got the double gym candy. We got an order of the uh, of the deep fried macaroni and cheese, the loaded fries. He was bringing out all the samples, the sauces. Can I ask you a question you about the loaded cheese? The loaded mac and cheese. Did you mess up and order the half, the full order, or did you start with the half? No, no, we got we got Fleetwood mac and cheese. Yeah, and they were they were two little two little like Rice Krispie treat size deep fried bricks of like smoked gouda. Mac and cheese. And it is some of the best fried mac and cheese I have ever yeah. eaten. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was dynamite. And then on top of that, so I finished my double mac and cheese. I had to have a bite of Heather's burger that she's so high. And and I had a, a good bit of the loaded fries. Heather had more of the loaded fries than I because I knew I had a double burger and I had the mac and cheese. We brought one of the mac and cheese bricks home and we brought most of her she's so high burger. I'll tell you what, man, it was even better the next day cold. Oh, because everything kind of got to marry yeah, together a little longer. Everything congealed and just got all stuck together, man. I, oh, my God. I'm telling you. Next day at like, you know, 9 in the morning, that was a good breakfast. No kidding. I think yeah. that's what my uh, Living La Vida Porca ended up being. And, oh, dear <laughs> God, it was so good. The names are so great, man. And he's just... He's just a nice guy. He man. really he's is. Nice guy. Uh, we're he's actually his Johnny Cash T-shirt and just doing his thing and just humble and and he knows he's doing a good thing, but he's not a jerk about it. He loves that that people come in and and drop names and say we're so and so's buddy and the whole you know we, the 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 community of people that's going down there to support him. He's just he's just a regular guy that's just trying to make an honest living and, and serve up some good food. And I, I couldn't support him anymore. I, I couldn't either. And we're actually, um, when we interview him on the 8th, we are going to start putting plans in place to launch a monthly podcast for him. Oh, wow. Uh, something we've been discussing. And uh, the first thing that I pitched for him to do was to start in November and to do a uh, rock and roll take on the traditional Thanksgiving. Sure, he could do it. I think that would be amazing. I just want to be there for the tasting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it, man. But now that we're well, sufficiently hungry, <laughs> uh, I, made sure, I made sure and 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 eat before I called you guys because I knew that I knew that we were going to get into this. <laughs> you, you, we did the same thing, but it still doesn't help. <laughs> I'd still kill for one of those burgers. Oh, for sure. Um, but if you are in Memphis and you are looking for some really good, reasonably priced grub, uh, 630 North Highland in Memphis, go check out Rock and Grub, spelled R-A-W-K in Grub, because everything is as freshly made as it can be. I even think he makes his own ketchup. I wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't me either. Um... But now we get to dive into the other side of the First Lady's Man. 
Yeah, sure. The the wild punk rock band member playing on several, playing in several different bands. Um, yeah. How did your music career or hobby or however you want to classify it, I won't do that for you. Um, how did you begin your movement into the music world? Well, music, music has always been my life. Music is my passion. Music, music spins, spins my world for sure. Um, I, I come from a musical family. There's always music in the house, music in the car. My mom had a beautiful singing voice. Uh, my dad played trumpet. Uh, big Elvis fans, big Beatles fans, typical stuff. Uh, I had uh, two uncles that were over at the house all the time, two single uncles that were over at the house all the time playing Fleetwood Mac and Joe Cocker and Linda Ronstadt and ABBA. And then I had a, another uncle that was married, and, and he and his wife had a, 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 a jukebox with 78s and were playing big band oh. and stuff. So we'd go over there. I mean, it was just everywhere I went. And when I was, um, when I was little, like uh, six, seven years old, I, I wanted to play drums. But, you know, every kid wants to play drums because they want to bang on stuff. They want to make noise. And uh, the neighbor kid, uh, Ray Doyle, got drum lessons for his birthday. His birthday was before mine. And my mom was always saying, you know, well, wait, when you're in fourth grade, you can join instrumental music in school. And I'm sure she was probably thinking, like, well, then it's free. And then you can do it at the school. And then you don't do it in the house. And it's a win-win. You can do whatever you want. You just take it as a class. Well, um, the neighbor kid, like I said, he got private drum lessons before me, and I was to be tired. I'm like, Ray got drum lessons, Ray got drum So she took me in, and the guy said, he goes, you know, with kids that young, they've got to have natural rhythm or a natural desire to practice, and no kid wants to practice. So he said, let's do a lesson, and let's take it lesson by lesson and see how it goes. Turns out I got natural rhythm. I can't sing very well. I'm always a little bit flat. I got to struggle really, really hard to sing. And I don't read music because um, uh, around about the time uh, my drum teacher was trying to teach me the marimba and reading lessons, uh, reading, uh, reading music, um, girls came into the picture. So by that time I had a drum set and I was playing in a band called Clark Kent and the Cape Crusaders. And what the hell did I need to read music for if I was in a band already? So I wish I, I, wish I had I wish I hadn't jumped ship at, at that point, but I, I took private lessons all the way up through um, eighth or ninth grade, I think, uh, and and uh, and started playing in bands in high school, battle of the bands, talent shows, garage shows, uh, uh, people's people's sixteen parties at the local country club and stuff. Played all over the place. And in college, you know, as soon as I got to college, I found a band and started playing with that. That fizzled after college, and then. When I was bartending out of college, uh, this one band that had just gotten a local record contract, and their name was Who Is God? Um, uh, Who Is God with a question mark? And they got it off a, a Life magazine uh, cover. And they just thought, oh, well, that's a, that's a cool band name. So their drummer announced, right after they got the record contract, their drummer announced that he had, he had seriously, he had joined the Church of Satan. <laughs> and oh. they were like, they were like, dude, are you kidding? He goes, yeah, no, not like demons and and the stuff you see in the movies, but but I I pledge my allegiance to to Satan and that darker side of life. And well, you like, can't very well have a band named Who Is God if you're not going to be a Satanist band and have a Satanist drummer. Well, exactly. So they're like, dude, you're out, man. What the hell? What, what, what's wrong with you? So, so I was I was bartending at this place in D.C. and and the guitar player from my band, uh, uh, we were Love and Hate, and then we turned into Forgotten Sons. And uh, uh, our guitar player, who was writing half of the original stuff, uh, decided to go on and follow the dead around for the summer and sell burritos. And it was like, what the hell's going? So I was bitching that, that our guitar player split, and and my buddy Bean was bitching that his drummer was had pledged allegiance to Satan. And we said, well, let's get together. So I went over and went into his basement, and we basically rewrote an entire album and then released it. And that's the first self-titled uh, uh, Who Is God album. Um, it's got the uh, the Crab Boy from the Circus Sideshows on the cover. And it's, you can find it on YouTube. You can find it on iTunes, Rhapsody, CD Baby, the works. I have copies up in my, up in my, uh, up in my office here. And, um, and so that was on the look label called um 
uh, Death Rebel Music, and we toured, and we had displays and ten of records. Uh, Jeff Tremaine, the, the creator and, and director of Jackass, he's a, a good friend, and he did all the artwork on the albums. I've got some of that artwork uh, up in my garage in my rehearsal studio here in, in Maryland. And um, and Jeff did, a, did our second album artwork as well, our, our full, what we call our full length. Um, and that was uh, produced by our good friend uh, Chris Hoskett of the Rollins Band. And we ran into Chris because the Rollins Band was doing, uh, was doing the, the club tours, practicing up their second um, album for Imago in the 90s, the, the Wait album, which came off uh, the, the, um, the End of Silence, was their first one that they toured on that first Lollapalooza with. And, uh, and when it came time to do their second album, they were doing a club tour. And when they came to D.C., we opened for them at the old 930 Club, the historic 930 Club on F Street. And we stayed in touch. And Chris said he wanted to come back to town and produce our uh, our, our big full-length release, which has, I don't know, like four, I think like 14 tracks on it, the Pawn album. You, you, and that's all on it. you got to tell us some stories about opening for the Rollins Band. <laughs> well, I, I got... I got I got two good. I got. I, well, there's three. There's well, there's a number. There's a number. So, first of all, when 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 you're a guy in your in your early twenties and you're playing CBGBs, and the guitar player for the Rollins Band helps you load your gear in 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 New York into CBGBs. Wait, I mean, you, you really played you got, CBGBs? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You lucky bastard! I never even got to go through the door. Oh yeah, some of the, some of the, you know those those uh, uh, those guys you see running around town that got their CBGB shirts at, at Target or Walmart. Now I got I got mine at CBGB yeah. when I played that. That's why I won't buy one because I wanted it to come from the actual club. Yeah, well, hey, look, man, I didn't I didn't let myself buy a Motorhead T-shirt till I saw him live. Man, that's understandable. The only it's Kiss really T-shirt weird. I own is actually from the uh, tour they did here when they came to the Pyramid the last time. Oh, nice! And it was an unannounced tour date, so it wasn't even on the shirt. Oh, that's fan. Oh, that's even better. Yeah, <laughs> but um, uh, what is it about Rollins Band? I mean, I know you've having some stories with them. Is Henry as cool in person as he seems like he is when you see him in interviews and and things of that nature? What you see is one hundred percent what you get. The guy couldn't be cooler, couldn't be more genuine, couldn't be more intense, couldn't be more in your face. I mean, he just, um, super, super nice guy. He gave us all pre-release copies of his, uh, Black Flag book, Get in the Van, before it came out. We were, we were playing a show with, it was, uh, Helmet and Rollins Band were touring with, with, uh, Les Claypool's side project from Primus oh, called Sausage. <laughs> and we, and we opened up for him in D.C. And it's funny, I was uh, I was backstage. It was a big open field show, and I was walking up to the porta potty back in the in the in the backstage area. And I reached for the handle, and just as I come around the corner, uh, Henry Rollins grabs the handle first, and he goes, "Do you need?" I go, "No, please." After you, and I said. Um, you know, he, he went in and used the porta potty, and, and so I used the porta potty right after him. And then we were chatting outside the porta potty, and it, and it rained and rained and rained that day. I said, "Man, this must be like playing Woodstock for you." He goes, "Yeah, with outdoor festivals, we're getting used to playing in the rain." And we had a good laugh about that. And, he was, and the next time I saw him was in New York. We were playing a show. We were playing a show at a place called the Under Acme. There was an Acme Grill. And underneath, you had these long, long steps. There was a tiny little club. You have to load all your gear. Getting your gear down into the club was no problem. And then, you know, after about nine, ten beers and about three in the morning, trying to get your gear back up out of the club was a different story. But anyway, we're, we're down there hanging out. And we're about to go on. And Haskett walks in. And behind Haskett, I said, hey, Chris, what's up, man? You know, we give a hug, whatever. And, uh, and he goes, yeah, I brought some friends with me. We were all out to dinner and they, they heard that I'd produced your album and you were playing new stuff tonight. So they wanted to come out. I'm like, great. And I look behind him and there's Henry. And it was right by the door. And then there's someone else with him and they had a little bit of an entourage. We had our entourage there. So everyone kind of went off to the bar. They were hanging out talking and Henry and I were just stuck sort of by the door. And he's, you know, what time, what time to go on? And I said, oh, we got, you know, about half an hour. Okay. How many songs are you playing? Oh, we're doing 10, so about a 30-minute set. Yeah, if you have 30-minute set, you're leading off with the new stuff. Yeah, you please with what Chris did in the studio. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was just like, I mean, he was grilling me about, you know, the whole thing. 
and he keeps looking over his back the whole time and kind of like looking at the bar. I said, Henry, man, you got people to talk to. Please, don't let me hold you up. He goes, no, 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 no. Just making sure our friends behave themselves. We were out to dinner with David Lee Roth. He wanted to come check out this band that Chris was producing. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, you mean like uh, Van Halen, David Lee Roth? And Henry looks at me like, you know, like there's another. And I'm yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> but I just, I didn't imagine David Lee Roth and Henry Rollins hanging out. He goes, yeah, we're buddies from L.A., and now he's back here in New York. He's doing his EMP stuff. And this, the funny thing was, this was right after David Lee Roth got busted in in some park, some famous park in New York, buying like a dime bag or something. So he's buying like this little tiny bag of weed, Diamond David Lee Roth. Is this before or after he kind of, when they did the reunion with Van Halen and he Be- can't... No, no, before. Okay. Before. This would have been like, this would have been like 93, I think. Okay, so, so you're just, talking about sometime after the Crazy from the Heat solo record. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Because that, yeah. It's definitely after the solo album, before the reunion with Van Halen. Okay. And uh, and and he was he was in he was a, a, a working EMT uh, uh, ambulance guy in 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 New York. David Lee Roth was. I remembered hearing that he had gotten that. I never knew if he actually did it. <laughs> no, he did. I mean, can you imagine? Like, let's just say I ride a motorcycle, so I'm driving down Manhattan, New York, uh, you know, Broadway, some shit like that, and and all of a sudden I I fall off my motorcycle. I'm laying there in the street, and the guy that pulls my helmet off and gets me in the split is like, I would think I was dead. I would, I would literally think I was dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was that, it was that era of Diamond Dave. But I, I, so I looked where Henry was looking, and there's Diamond Dave in a, in a white baseball hat, holding a, a Johnny, uh, 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 Jack Daniels on the rocks, and hanging out with my band, talking and choosing everybody and yucking it up, man. So we got to hang out with David Lee Ruff. But here's the funny thing. My girlfriend at the time had invited one of her friends that had moved to New York to come out to see her boyfriend's band, my band, whatever. And and I, after the show, we're upstairs at the bar, and I said, so did you guys get to hang out with David Lee Roth? And they're like, what? I said, David Lee Roth came in with Henry Rollins. And they're like, no, really? I'm like, dude, I, I'm telling you, man. And so they're like, no way. So the girl that my girlfriend had invited to the show goes, oh, my God. I had sex with the cop that arrested David Lee Roth. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Man, it's a good thing you didn't come over and see David Lee Roth, because if you said that, someone would have taken you out, man. Oh. You don't arrest David Lee Roth for a dime bag? No. You arrest dime bag Daryl for a dime bag, but that's just for the, you know. For the night. Just for the irony. <laughs> so so there, there's, there's a couple Rollins stories of, Hanging out at the porta potty at backstage at a at a at a festival playing with helmet and sausage and 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 getting the advanced copy of getting the van and then uh, him introducing me to David Lee Roth man and it was just all very surreal but I, I'll tell you his this this will go come full circle to the uh, to the history thing Henry's doing a show now on um, on H two called Ten Things You Didn't Know and it's like Ten Things You Didn't Know About the Flag Ten Things You Didn't Know About the Alamo. Ten things you didn't know about the Constitution. Ten things you didn't know about National Archives. Ten things you didn't know about the Grand Canyon. I mean, it's, 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 and it's a great show. It's really, really well done. It's totally Henry. And I was sitting at home, having just finished my first book, and I'm watching this Ten Things You Don't Know marathon on, on TV. And I was like, you know what, man? I should just I should tell Henry what I'm up to. We're, we're not we don't hang out on a regular basis. If he ran over me with his car, I'd probably have to say. Hey, Henry, I'm that guy from that band that Chris produced. I mean, we are not best friends by any stretch of the imagination. But I thought, what what, what do I have to lose? So I, look, I Googled Henry Rollins. I got on his website. There's a, you know, it's like, hey, contact Henry Rollins. Email Henry at HenryRollins.com. And I'm like, all right. I said, hey, Henry, I'm Andy. We've got a mutual friend in Chris Haskett. I drummed in Who Is God. He produced our album. In fact, you introduced me to David Lee Roth. A million years ago in New York City. Anyway, I see you're still doing really, really well and into the history. So am I. I did this C-SPAN project. I've got this book. Blah, 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 blah. Saturday night. It had to be about 10 o'clock. Before 11 o'clock, I had an email back from Henry going, Andy, so great to hear from you. I totally remember that night in Manhattan with David Lee. 
what a gas, blah, blah, blah. Congratulations on your book. Congratulations on your series. I'll try and catch it. You know, let's catch up next time I'm in D.C. Whatever. So, I mean, the guy, he, he, if you email Henry Rollins, he's going to email you back, man. He just, he just could not be nicer. Damn it, we're emailing he, Henry Rollins. <laughs> I mean, the fact that he remembered me and remembered all that stuff, he just couldn't. Couldn't be nice. You know who else is really nice like that? Ian Mackay of Fugazi. I'm not familiar with that. Threat. You're more of a punk fan than I am, Devin, so this is... Well, look up. You'll love it. it Minor Threat was Henry Rollins' first band with Ian Mackay in D.C. on Discord Records. They made their own label. I mean, there could not be more punk rock. They made their own record sleeves. They pressed their own records. They paid for it all. They never charged more than five bucks for an all-ages show. It's, these are just... These are just punk rocks, punk rockers. And then later on, when Henry moved from D.C. to L.A. to be in Black Flag, uh, Ian split and made Fugazi, which is a huge D.C. band. You'll YouTube them. You'll find, like, okay. Waiting Room and, and a whole bunch of other. I mean, they got tons of albums. So later on in life, I, I, I went uh, metal project for a while, the ghetto metal. It seemed like, uh, like a more, a more hip-hop version of... Um, of body count, like less speed metal and, and more, more, um, more hip hop, if you can imagine that. But that's all on YouTube and iTunes and Rhapsody CD Baby, all that stuff for Throwdown Syndicate. So I did an album with Throwdown Syndicate and on my last show I was playing with a, with a very, very influential DC guitar player and his project was American Corpse Flower at the time. But Fred was in a, a in a, in a seminal band. I mean, Fred was in a band that inspired the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And, and that band was called uh, Strange Boutique. I'm sorry, a uh, Beef Eater. Beef Eater out of D.C. I've heard and of Beef, Beef Eater. Eater. Okay. Okay, so Beef, the Beef Eater, the Beef Eater guys, uh, the Fred, Fred Freak Smith of Beef Eater helped start Who Is God. He played bass for a little while until we got a full-time bass player in Stafford Mather, who is best friends with Dave Grohl, and that's how we got to hang out with Dave Grohl at one of our, a number of our different shows. But that's, I'm, I'm getting way, I'm gonna way I'm going to start making track. you our guest booker. <laughs> no, 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 you don't want that. <laughs> yeah, I'm too. I'm, I'm too ADD, man. I'm all over the place. None of your shows would make any sense. But anyway, so back. <laughs> they to don't the already. Time, so, so well, then, then we're perfect company. So, so uh, I played the last show with Fred Freak Smith in in, uh, in American Corpse Flower, and my band Throwdown Syndicate was playing at the Black Cat in D.C. And Ian was there. And Ian's best friends with Michael Stipe from R.E.M. and all those guys that all hang out on that sort of indie scene and that college radio scene before R.E.M. got to the pop, you know, mega mega stars that, that they are today, back when they were playing the little clubs in D.C. and everyone was just hanging out. It was just, you know, what you did. So anyway, Ian wrote me a really, really nice note after the show that I kept. Uh, an email, and he just said, I'm really sorry that that was your last show with J-Dam Syndicate, because I really enjoyed the drums, it was heavy, it was groovy, and you guys really had something going on, and, and I thought that that was, I thought that that was really cool, he didn't, he didn't have to do that at all, and I still run into him at, you know, music stores and stuff around D.C. and various shows, so, but, but nice guy, all, all, all very nice guys. Now, you bring up music stores, and I know, in, in watching as much as we have, we've actually, I think, uh, ingested everything we can find on from or on Henry Rollins here in the last few weeks uh, because he had his new stand-up special that came out, which I don't really consider his stand-up. He's just telling crazy stories. But, oh, well, he call, yeah, he calls it spoken word. Right. He's just, he's just a... He's just a, a, he's just he's a great a storyteller. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and we watched a few other things that he had done, and the... One thing that comes across in all the interviews is his his love of actually having a physical copy, going into a music store, supporting the local artists. Uh, yeah. What are some of your favorite finds in a music store that maybe you weren't looking for? Well, uh, Henry used to work with with another um, uh, friend of mine who started. He had one of the very first import vinyl underground record stores in in the area here in, in in dc and it was called yesterday and today records and strangely enough it was outside of dc it wasn't in georgetown with all the other punk rock clubs and and punk rock stores that, that carry our records like uh smash and commander salamander and all the stuff like that 
This yesterday and today was out on the Rockville Pike, which is a pretty ritzy part of, of Rockville, and all the punk rockers worked there. And it was in the back of this little strip mall that had like an Indian beer, wine, and deli that used to sell the beer to under you know underage kids. It was that kind of hangout. And 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 um, there were there were there was a rare section and a bootleg section and and I would go in there uh, right about when I was starting to get into U two uh, around the War album so this would have been 1983 and um, and they had already had the success with with Boy and October but their but their radio uh, play and their and their real uh, you know th- what what started the ball rolling from was that 1983 War album. And I started, I was introduced through yesterday and today at the whole world of foreign imports and EPs and 45s were making, you know, they'd never gone away. And so what I found in there, and then that got me to a place called Joe's Record Paradise, which was another uh, Maryland uh, little little treasure and another place called Final Ink. And they would all have these booths at these uh, record conventions and stuff that I would go to in the area. But what I was able to collect at all these places and started it yesterday and today where, where Henry and Ian both worked was I got colored vinyl 45s of U2 songs before they were on albums on CBS labels. And the interesting thing about CBS labels is that for the rest of the world, they were on Island Records, the same uh, record label that Bob Marley and a bunch of the bunch of the, uh, the the reggae artists were all on. But CBS had a contract with U2 because the first like Battle of the Bands or some contest that they did in Dublin that they won a recording contract with a major label, but it was just for pressing and releasing in Ireland. So I've got this whole slew of U2 45s of U2 singles before their first album, all on colored vinyl pressed on CBS labels that are very, very rare uh, before before that contract ran out. And then they were on Island and God knows what they're on now. But uh, uh, but wow. this is this is back in the this is like from these these are these are singles from like 1978 when they were when U2 was in high school. And then from, from there you found like old Sex Pistols concerts and old Dead Kennedys 45s and Ramones and Shackle Jerks and, and then the, all the, all the Discord stuff ended up to be in there. And that's Minor Threat, Holy Rollers, Love Fish, Teen Idols, Marginal Man, uh, just the, the list goes on and on and on of, uh, of these, these DC based bands that were all on this punk rock label. It was all just designed to put music out that kids could get and afford and was never designed to make any money or, or go go international. And, and they ended up, Discord ended up handling our Death Rebel music releases with, uh, with Chris on, on, um, on the international catalog, which was, which was fantastic for us. Nice. Now, I would be remiss if we're going to discuss punk and I don't bring up uh, the most influential punk band for me, which was The Clash. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Now, tell me what kind of an impact, because I didn't get into The Clash until I was in college. Uh, tell me the impact they had on you, because they changed my entire view on what music could sound like. Yeah. The, the, the Clash The Clash is an interesting experiment. The, let me see. The Clash is like a harder version of early police. Like, The Clash has that reggae influence, and there's a couple of books that, that you should read to really, really understand, because I didn't understand it completely, how reggae and dub and the Brits and how it all works and figures out and, and how reggae is really Jamaican punk rock because of the subject matter and it's a different style of music, but the attitude makes reggae punk rock music because it's against governments and it's against, you know, anti-establishment movements and and, and, and this underground lifestyle sort of thing. But when the police took their pop rock and mixed it with reggae, it's like, it's like the clash came in and, 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 and made that harder and edgier and dirtier and grittier. Like, okay, so, so the, the clash is to the police like Black Sabbath is to Led Zeppelin. You know what I mean? Gotcha. The blues so, influence that they had in the, in Black Sabbath yeah, and, is and, more accessible and, and like, because of Led Zeppelin. 
Well, and, and Led, Ze- Led Zeppelin was like a music that your mom and dad would have let you listen to, but Black Sabbath isn't. Right. And the police is a kind of music that your folks would have let you listen to, but the Clash weren't because they were, you know, filthy lookers or, you know, you know whatever you want to, uh, you know, because they said bollocks and stuff like that. You know, it, just, it was just the language that was used, the attitude, the tone of it all um, made it made it so so that, that one one was a little more uh, uh, radio friendly or user friendly. And then, I mean, by the time Combat Rock and... and uh, um, um, oh, what's the, what's the hit off Combat Rock? Sorry if you don't know. Rock the Casbah. By the time Rock the Casbah comes out, but if you go back to like Train in Vain and, and some of those early uh, Clash hits, uh, Radio Clash, all that stuff, there's they're so, there's there's that little bit of reggae, that little, and mixed with punk, and and it, 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 it's, it's just great to see how, that, how all of that music uh, 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 Evolved and, and, and where it all came from, and so the, the books that I would suggest to listeners when they're when they're looking at punk rock and the evolution of punk rock, there's there's one about the East Coast punk rock scene called uh, Please Kill Me, and it's made up of of all of the bands from like Detroit, New York, New Jersey, uh, Blondie, Television, MC5, Iggy and the Stooges, uh, all that old CBGB stuff. And, and, and how the English affected when they came over the David Bowies, the Elvis Costellos, uh, oh, Lou Reed, Velvet Underground, all that New York scene, Andy Warhol. And the, the book is comprised all of quotes of people that were there in the scene creating it. And it's just a fantastic book. Then the West Coast American punk rock movement is called We've Got the Neutron Bomb. And that's all your circle jerks and black flags and dead Kennedys and all the stuff that made up that, but that was sort of had like the surf Dick Dale influence as opposed to the European punk influence. Then, if you want to understand, I mean, it's more of a commercial basis of it. It doesn't have that that general uh, uh, beginnings that, that, some of the, that some of the other books I mentioned, but there's a book by Johnny Rotten called No Blacks, No Dogs, No Irish. And it's just a really, really good historical recount of what was going on, who was playing where and when. And right now I'm currently reading a book called Lemmy. And Lemmy was at the beginning of the new British heavy metal movement that came off of the old heavy metal movement that was mixing in with all the punk rockers. I mean, like, I just read a chapter last night on the plane home, and, and Lemmy's talking about trying to teach Sid Vicious how to play bass before he joined the Sex Pistols. And in the previous chapters, he's talking about getting into bar fights with John Lennon. So, I mean, we can't leave Lemmy and Motorhead <laughs> out of this equation. And and also, when you go back to that uh, uh, Please Kill Me book about the East Coast punk rock, it's got all the Ramones and all that stuff. So, I mean, it, 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 it gets you everything you need. Well, and I think we have come full circle. We went from a book, we went to we went to food. We went from food into punk, and we went from punk back to books. Amazing how that happens, almost like we planned it. Hey, and we didn't have a damn clue, or at least I didn't. <laughs> but uh, you told me you told me today. You said we'll start off talking about first ladies, and uh, then we'll talk about some food, and then we'll get into punk rock. And I said, okay. And then you gave me a call, and this is how it ended. <laughs> And Andy, I know we're gonna have to have you on again because there's gonna be some more music talk. We gotta have some more first ladies talk. Uh, definitely plan on keeping in touch. We will uh, send you a link as soon as this goes up. I want to thank you again for being on the show. Uh, tell Princess Golden Bun we said hello. And when Absolutely. we are in town, we will eat what we are going to affectionately refer to our burger as as the fat bottom girl in your honor. Love it. <laughs> One of my favorite Queen songs. Well, Andy, I thank you so much, and we will talk to you again. Thank you, guys. We'll talk soon. All right, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.